Okay, so we're going to begin continuing on in the series about the Midot, character, nature, what one needs to work on, strengths and weaknesses. After all, certain Midot are positive Midot and certain ones are negative. Certain ones we want to acquire, we want to refine, while others we want to have under control, we want to subdue. It is not possible, as I've explained in the to eliminate a particular characteristic. It will always be dormant, like dormant genes, or recessive, I think they're called, right? They, they may come back. Somebody who was addicted to smoking could have let go of it, gave up on it. Uh, one of these days, it could go back to it. Same thing with alcohol, no guarantees. So obviously, anybody who's interested in working on himself, which is a lifetime task, it never stops, needs to be constant about it, needs to be serious about it. In Tehillim, David Melech begins with the very first pasuk by telling us that in life, fortunate is the person, fortunate is a person who did not heed or go by the advice of the wicked. A lot of people who have wicked ideas out there, who all day long, that's all they're thinking about, is how to cheat, how to harm others. And people can be affected. People are influenced by other people's deeds, by other people's successes. And they may want to emulate them. They may want to befriend them. So David Amena points out right away, be careful with who you you befriend, be careful not to go amongst the Rashaim, not to stand amongst the Hataim, the sinners. And then he finishes with adding a third group, Moshav Letzim Lo Yashav, and that did not sit in the assembly of mockers. Even though the word Letzim is also clowns, but I will explain soon there's a big difference between a clown and a, a Letz that the rabbis are talking about one who has midat litzanut, which is what we'll be speaking about tonight. Litzanut means mockery, to make fun of others, to scoff at them. So fortunate is a person who does not associate with these kind of people, including Moshav Litzim, where these people congregate, where they assembly, clowns, or in more precise, scoffers or mockers. In order to properly understand this midah, or this individual, what is a let's? What is the let's that David Melech is talking about? What is the let's that Shalomo Melech speaks about great, very, very much? He speaks about the let's many, many times in Mishle. We're not talking about the Batchan. The Batchan is the one that makes jokes, is the one that makes people happy. That's a mitzvah, if anything. These people have a chilek rolam for making others happy, for bringing about happiness amongst people who would otherwise be sad or depressed. So we're not talking about that kind of let's or batchan. We're talking about a person who is evil, a person whose whole intention and behavior is to cause about or to bring about distance from emit, distance from truth, to cause or to bring about a furthering or a diminishing of ruhanyut, of spirituality. A, a let's, a scoffer, therefore, in, in, in other words, makes fun of anything that is spiritual in nature, anything which has any ruhanyut, spirituality to it. That is the one we're talking about. Now, this individual is dangerous and difficult to correct. Both dangerous to himself and to others, difficult to correct, because this particular midah that we're talking about, letzanut, mockery, has various klipot, as the Kabbalah would call it. Klipot meaning shells of impurity, many layers of, that are difficult to penetrate, to penetrate through, layers that separate him from the emet, from wanting to, to correct himself. To properly understand what these layers are and what is going to be the difficulty that he will have in correcting this midah, we turn to Mishle. And in Mishle, Shalomo Amelech, in characterizing who this individual is, says the following words Zed Yahir, let's Shemo. 
Zedya here means an individual who is a wanton sinner. Zed, a wanton sinner. He does things intentionally, on purpose. Bezadon. In other words, he is evil in his nature. He's, it's an evil nature. So that is the word Zed. So you have, therefore, one ingredient called Zed and the other ingredient called Yahir. Yahir is arrogance. So you have an individual who's both a Zed, a bad person, an evil person, and a Yahir, an arrogant person. So Zed Yahir lets Shemo. So when you have a person who derides others, makes fun of others, there is a combination in him of a certain degree of arrogance, which we spoke about separately, plus a certain amount of Zed, or of wanting to cause others harm, wanting to sin. In other words, bezadon meaning intentionally, not something that's done unintentionally. But th that is what motivates him, that is what drives him, the combination of these two characteristics. And since you have two very, very difficult characteristics combined in one, he is what we would call in, in Hebrew an egos kashe, a hard walnut, something that's hard to crack, someone that will be very difficult to convince. And as I said earlier, this is somebody who is dangerous to society, dangerous to others, and as well to, as to himself. The difference between the good letzanut and the bad one can be seen in, in the following fact. What does the hota do to people? When people hear something that is cute, a joke, what does it do to them? It opens up their mind. It tends to give them encouragement. It tends to stimulate. So bedihuta, or positive letzanut, as it's called bedihuta, actually opens up the mind. It, it's stimulant. Whereas the bad one, the bad letzanut, what it tends to do is close the mind and cool off any motivation. It actually hurts the motivation very, very, very much. So you have people who are being stimulated, people who are being encouraged, people whose minds are opening up, while others, chaz shalom, depending on, on what is said to them, can actually be impaired. It can actually cause them to not be any more motivated in whatever it is that they were motivated before. So this individual who has this particular midah, we will have a very difficult time arguing with. <coughs> you will have a very difficult time giving him musar. And you will come across such individuals in life. People who no matter what you <coughs> say to them, no matter what you do, will never agree to what you say, will never accept your musar, your rebuke, may not even want to sit down and even argue and speak to you. They won't even give you a chance. And because of that, because of the difficulty of reaching these people, guess what? This is one of the very few people, if, if they have this midah, that they're almost called a mikre avud in Hebrew, a lost case. Now, we never want to say on anybody, he's a lost case. Because in reality, there is no lost case. Everybody can even at the last moment, last day of his, of his life, can do teshuvah. The teshuvah may not help him in every way, but it could, it, it's, better than, it's better than nothing. But, as I've said about gava, arrogance, there are certain midot that are so difficult that if a person is really stuck in any one of them, it will be harder, more difficult for him to come out. This one is one of the most difficult of all together with Gava. And it has, part of it is Gava. Part of it is arrogance. And that is why it's very difficult for him to work on himself. He doesn't even want to listen. You can't even argue with him. You, can ever, you cannot ever convince him. No matter what you say and what you do, it's a, it's a, it's a waste of a time. If you read Mishle, Mishle talks about it more in detail. He says, part of the problem of Aletz is Lo yehav letz ocheach lo. A letz does not like to be rebuked. He does not like criticism. He doesn't welcome it. He brushes it off. Number two, vel hachamim lo yelech. And he never goes to attend a lecture or a class because what's a lecture or a class? He may be told off. He may be told the truth. He's not interested in that. 
So you have an individual here who's locking himself out of any chances of improving himself. He does not want the tochacha. He does not want the musar, the rebuke, the criticism. Neither does he want to attend a class. He doesn't go to chachamim. He doesn't consult and seek the advice. He doesn't ask somebody if he's right or wrong. He always, always acts on his own and thinks he's right. So how are we going to help this person? You, you, you begin to see how this let's sanut or this let's is a very, very difficult case. Very difficult to convince. You can never argue with him. <coughs> Therefore, because of this midot, because of these characteristics, especially the ga'ava, he will really never have any interest in self-improvement. This whole series is about self-improvement. After all, midot, working on midot is self-improvement. <coughs> you, we we want to have a better life. We want to have a better marriage. We want to ha- have a better relationship with people, whether it's our boss or employees or, or friends, neighbors, and the like. For that to happen, one needs to have good control of his midot. If you're going to be a stingy person, I mean, not, every, not too many people are going to like you. And you can't hide these midot. Arrogance, caste, anger, laziness, these stand out. People eventually know about it. So a person who is a let's, I mean, not only are people going to know about it, it's, it's, it's really going to stand out in a, in, in a very, very sad way. Sad way because imagine if it's your son, Chaz Shalom. Imagine if somebody's close to you. It's one thing you can't reach your neighbor. It's one thing you can't reach your friend. He's a let's. But what if it's a child, chaz v'shalom, a son, a daughter, somebody very close to you, that you and you and you argue and you argue and you argue, you're not getting anywhere, or a spouse, chaz v'shalom. Then it begins to be more serious. So this particular midah, unfortunately, is a real midah. It exists out there. And if you want to look it up a little bit in Sefer or Chot Sadikim, you will find it under shatika, under silence. And I'll tell you a little bit later why perhaps it's under silence. But it can be found in various places. But Sefer Mishle, in the Sefer Mishle of Shalom Melech, you see quite a few quotes that he's referring to this individual who is a problem not only to those around him, but to himself. So Shalom Melech continues to tell us, therefore, don't even try. Imagine, don't even try. Yeah, he says so. Don't even try to rebuke a let's, if he's a proven let's, a mocker, because he will hate you. What does it mean he will hate you? Only fights will come out of it. In other words, not only will he not accept what you're saying, he will hate you, he will not want to speak to you, it will only make things worse. So don't even try. Now that's very, very interesting. Usually we know when it comes to Musar, especially those that you have some influence over, you have to try. Family members, you better try. It's your responsibility to say something if something is wrong. With this guy, he says, Al tochach. Don't. In the Torah it says, Ochiach tochiach it amitecha. It's a mitzvah to give rebuke. It's a mitzvah to point out, to teach. But now we're a let's. Only sin'ah will come out of it. Only problems will come out of it. He's, he's going he's gonna to attack you. He's, he's going to bother you about it. Just leave him alone. We don't see that being said about other people. But a let's, yes, a let's, you can't get anywhere with him. And even if you do sh- prove to him the truth, Shlomo Melech continues on with another pasuk, you sar let's, you lokeach lo kalon. You sar let's, lokeach lo kalon. One who does rebuke, even if you point out the truth, you show him where he's wrong, in the end, you will be embarrassed, not him. Because if it's, in the, if it's a public scene, he will make a big deal out of it. In other words, don't even think of, of proving it to him, because you will come out embarrassed. Not only won't you gain anything, you will be embarrassed as a result. So, this becomes a very difficult situation when we're dealing with somebody who's very close to us. We realize that there are people out there who have this problem, but when somebody is close to you who, and you're trying to reach and you can't reach him, that is, is, is very, very sad. It becomes very, very difficult. As Shalomo Amelech says, Ben Chacham Musar Av Veletz Lo Shama Gyara. A Ben Chacham, a Ben Chacham, a smart son, will listen to the Musar, will accept his father's rebuke. But Veletz, 
Let's lo shama gera. A let's a, a mocker, one who makes fun of, of, of Musar, will never hear what his father, his own father, has to say. His teachers, what they have to say. His friends, what they have to say. So listen very, very carefully. This is a tipus, a type, an individual who you will meet. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have so much talk about it. The Gemara, the Pesukim, the, there are various quotes in Chazal that talk about the difficulty in reaching certain people. And this one is not only difficult, it's almost impossible. What do you do if you have a student in a class who's a troublemaker? It's a big question in the, in the, in amongst principals and teachers, how do you deal with a difficult student who's, who's a troublemaker? If you kick him out, he will lose out. He won't learn, he'll end up in the public school. If you keep him in, he's bothering everybody else. You have to really walk a fine line. You have to really see what the problem is. Perhaps you can fix it. Perhaps you can deal with it. Perhaps you can somehow uh, improve the situation, right? have a separate class. When it comes to somebody who's a big troublemaker, the Pasuk says, Garesh let's ve'etze madon. Remove him completely. Remove the let's. And if you remove the let's, yetze madon. Madon means the fights, the problems. That may be your only choice. If the individual, if that Talmud is a real troublemaker, but not just a troublemaker, he's a let's, that means he may cool others off too. <coughs> he may cause others problems. You're better off removing him, even though it's at his expense, but it should not be at the expense <coughs> of all the other kids. So sometimes that's the only choice. The only choice may be Garesh Letz, the Yetzemadon. I'm going to quote to you a little bit about what the Chachamim say. The Chachamim tell us about Letzanut, that it's something very, very serious. A person who conducts himself in this manner throughout his life, Rabbi Stelas does not see the, the Shekhinah. There are four groups that do not see the Shekhinah. When a person leaves this world, he's able to see things that he was not able to see while he was in this physical world, including being able to experience getting close to the Shekhinah. One group that does not see the Shekhinah, does not have this beautiful spiritual experience, is the Kat of Letzanim. The, the cut or the, the group of mockers. Because of the kind of life they led, a uh, life which is not serious, not serious about anything, not about misfort, not about life, making fun of anything, making fun of others. Because of that, they don't deserve it. And they, don't, they won't get to, be, to, do, to enjoy being close to the Shekhinah. That is a terrible punishment. Another, another Gemara says that those individuals who are always making fun of others, Yesurim ba'im alehim. They will have many uh, situations where they will experience pain, pain and suffering throughout their life at some point. They will end up going to Gehenom. And while they're alive, they will also suffer from economics. In other words, people who are letzanim will eventually suffer even in Olam Azeh, not only in Olam Abba. Usually many, certain things are reserved for Olam Abba, for the world to come. Sometimes Hashem punishes or sends a kapara even in Olam Azeh. Well, in this world, but the question is why? Why does it happen in Olam Azeh? The rabbis tell us that a person who is occupied in Torah, a person who learns Torah, the Torah acts as a defense, as a shield from Yisurim, from pain. Torah in itself is not just a mitzvah, it also is a protector, a shield, a shield from pain and suffering. Obviously, some people, even if they learn a lot of Torah, they have all, all kinds of problems, but Torah in itself tends to shield a person away from many, many experiences, painful experiences. So one who is not learning Torah, one who is not occupied in the Torah, does not have that protection. Plus, another reason why the pain would come on him or other kinds of hardships is because there's no other way to reach this individual. We said nothing helps. We can't rebuke him. We can't speak to him. He's not accessible. 
How can we get to him? Hashem says, don't worry, you have, you have to leave it to me. I may have to do something to awaken him. So Yisurim, sometimes a painful experience, sometimes tends to do that. It tends to achieve that. Hashem doesn't do just something for no reason. There's a reason. There could also be a kapara here. But Yisurim also sometimes are intended to awaken a person that he's wrong, that he should change his ways. Plus, of course, Hashem wants to remove these people out of the sight from being able to be influential on others. So by <coughs> diminishing their influence, by making their life a little bit hard, perhaps that may take them away or stop them. So the rabbis warn people who are litzanim, people who are scoffers, mockers, that this is what they should be expecting in their life at some point. And as I, as I will explain a, a little bit later, there's a certain element of kfira also, a certain element of heresy in their demeanor, in, in how they behave. And because of that, they, they do need some sort of reminder. Then that reminder, of course, it cannot come from just a friend, a relative. It doesn't help. So Hashem sometimes has to get involved. Because, unfortunately, because it's very easy to be influenced by them and uh, to learn from their ways, the rabbis warn us to stay away from people who are not learned in Torah. It is mentioned, it is brought down in the Gemara, that whoever is not in Mikra, in Mishnah, and in Derech Eretz, <coughs> an individual who is not involved, who is not learned in Mikra, Humash, Mishnah, and Derech Eretz, in the ways of life, he does not have good character, you're better off staying away from him. Don't befriend him. Don't, don't associate with him. Just because he doesn't know... Uh, so therefore you can't be friendly. No, so, so if you look at Rashi, Masechet Kedushin, I think right. it is, and you will see what's wrong with an individual who has no Mikra, no Mishnah, and no Derech Heretz. So the commentaries explain that because he doesn't have any of these things, what will his conversation be all about? Dvarim Betelim Veletzanut. His conversation, therefore, the topics that he will talk about will be nonsense, will be dvarim betalin. And that, on that, the Pasuk says, Ub lo yashav, that you should not sit, sit amongst those who don't learn Torah, amongst those who don't have an interest in Torah. Because what will they talk about? If, if no, there's no Torah, they'll talk about dvarim betalin. And that is a moshav letzim. So you don't want to have anything to do with this, these kind of people. You don't want to sit too much with these people. Because you will be like them. You will, you will eventually uh, conduct yourself like them, perhaps. A person, therefore, who does not have these things, you, you don't want to spend too much time with him. And, that, and the rabbis tell us in different words in Pirkei Avot, the same idea, that Shnaim Shiyoshvim Ve'em Benehem Divre Torah, Moshav Letzim, two people who are talking politics. All they do is talk politics. No Torah whatsoever, and several hours go by. It's one thing if it's five minutes. That's a Moshav Letzim. You don't, you don't want to sit and play cards with somebody for hours and hours. You don't even want to play cards for a few minutes. But Kol Sheken, because this is Bitul Torah. It's a waste of time of Torah. That's number one. And number two, it is not a, a good habit. It is not a good thing. It does not lead to good things. One thing leads to another. The rabbis anticipated that people who are wasting their time, as we say in this country, killing the time, or using their time for the wrong things, eventually they will end up doing worse things. But before we go on, I want to make sure you understand precisely the various kinds of Letzanut, because there are different types of Letzanut, and the Sefer or Chot Sadikim, I believe, yeah, in the Chot Sadikim, he mentions the various types. There are five types of Letzanut. One, one type of Letzanut is Mishan Tendofi Be'acherim, simply makes fun of others. To make fun of others, it could be because he makes fun of some weakness that they have. Somebody is lame, somebody is blind, somebody is poor, or whatever. Noten dofi means to make fun, to deride others. That's one kind of letzanut. So that's a very bad kind of letzanut. Number two, makes fun of those who, who are failures. You know, some people are, as we call them in Hebrew, batlanim, a shlumil or shlumazo, as we say in Yiddish. You know, for whatever reason, that's just the way they are. They're not very street smart, I think they say. And they just, you know, 
people take advantage of them. So you have the let's who will make fun of all these people who don't know how to take care of themselves. That's another kind of let's. Number three, whatever others have done and he has not done, he makes, he belittles. Since he doesn't get the credit, since it's not him. He says, ah, this is nothing. And, and Shlomo Melech has a special pursuit for these people. He says, Ra'iti I saw a person who is smart in his eyes. He thinks he's smart. There is more hope for the fool. That is how Shlomo Melech expresses himself towards this guy. I, there's, there are people out there who think they're so smart. There's more hope for the fool. Why is there more hope for the fool? A guy who thinks he's smart is never going to ask advice. He thinks he's smart. He thinks he knows better. So he's going to make mistake after mistake. Whereas there's more hope for the fool because the fool, at least he knows. He's ignorant. He doesn't know. He's going to listen. Maybe he'll learn something. So this individual makes fun of others because he was not involved. He's not getting the credit. He's not the inventor. So therefore, he looks down at what others uh, have done. And this happens even without realizing it. I just saw an article about the new plane called the 787. Okay, 787 is, a, is, a, is <coughs> Boeing's latest plane with many uh, improvements, amongst them fuel efficiency and, and the like. But Boeing has a competitor. The competitor of Boeing is Airbus, right? And Airbus came out with their new plane, double-decker, bigger plane. Anyway, there was differences of opinion in what the world is going to want in the near future. So when this plane came out and, and, this, and the specifics were made public of, actually even in the very beginning, before it came out, the one, the, the, one of the representatives of Airbus made fun of the people at Boeing for doing or for choosing how to do certain things. I'd rather not get into specific details, but it has to do with the composite materials. This particular airplane, if you really want to know, the reason it's so fuel efficient is because the, it will be a lighter plane. It will be made of composite materials and plastics. So it won't weigh as much. But anyway, so he had this whole thing about how they're crazy, they're, they don't know what they're doing by doing that. Anyway, here you have one guy, I'm saying to myself, against many people who sat down and worked hours, and we're talking about smart people, who I'm sure thought about what he said, and I'm sure he'd weighed the pros and cons of everything, and reached a decision. Who is this one guy, just because he's the chief of this other company? But what does it tell you? Maybe because he's the competitor, he's not looking at it objectively. Maybe what he's trying to say, especially if it's in public, it's just to belittle the competition. To say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. That was a stupid move. It's very easy for a person to belittle the successes of others if he's not involved. He's not being objective about it. Especially if it's coming from Gava, or in this case also the competition, where he has reason to want to show that all that is of the, of the competitor is not good. Number four, Another type of let's is koveat small dvarim betalim, a person who intentionally sits down to just waste time. He's also called the let's. He's not making fun of anybody, but because he's wasting his time with, with uh, nonsense, that's also a form of let's And number five is people who are always joking. Now, there's nothing wrong with a joke once in a while, but to always joke is not a good thing because it, it removes the seriousness that a person should have about life and about maximizing one's time, about doing the right things, about being careful. There are various midot that are weakened as a result of a person who's always joking. Other midot are affected by it. So the Chachamin tells us to be very careful not to be always joking, especially after the Churban of the Bet HaMikdash. Ali Malay Adam Schok Piv, a person cannot be always joking. After, since we don't have a Bet HaMikdash, how could you be joking? How could you be making any joke? But as I said in the very beginning, if it, a little bit of humor is not only welcome, it's a good thing. You want, to, you want people to laugh. Laughing, you know, the Japanese and Chinese will tell you is very healthy. You know, there's classes in the morning. That's all they do is laugh, you know. 
Yeah, laugh and laugh and laugh. It's good. It's good. It's good for the system. It makes sense. Simcha, we know something very, very special. How can you bring about simcha? Sometimes through a joke. So milta de bidiochota, if it's, if it's intended to encourage and to make people happy, is a good thing. It's positive, and it should be done occasionally. But stam litlotzetz, this fifth category of letzanut, is not, a good, is not a good kind of letzanut either. All right. So I gave you a little bit of an introduction about this midah, a very, very serious midah, a midah that is difficult to correct. But even though I said difficult, I didn't say it's impossible. Right? It's just very, very difficult. So how do we deal with this midah? Or how do we deal with an individual who has this problem? He on his own will not seek help. You, if you try to rebuke him, he won't accept the criticism. He's a let's, right? And a let's doesn't like Musa. He doesn't go to shiurim. Because this particular midah consists of various other midot ra'ot, one of them being gava, as I said, zed yahir let's shemo. In other words, there's some gava there, there's some zadon, in other words, some badness to him. Right? So there's obviously various klipot here that are obstructing his progress. What is going to be required here to overcome all of that will also be a strong potion of midotovot. In other words, what did we say till now? It will be difficult to reach him, difficult to give him musar. He will not come to a class. He won't listen. So what can we do with him? You're wrong. This is not right. The only way he can come out of it is if somehow, if he is able to adapt, to take upon himself to work on various other positive midot. In other words, to just remove letzanut from the system, forget about it. It's there. So instead of tackling that problem, you've got to do a bypass. You know what a bypass is? You go around. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't unclog this. You can't remove this. It's dead. It's, it's full of plaque, plaque, right? So what do they do? That's what a bypass is in the heart, in the arteries. They, you have to create new bypasses to reach the heart. So here you have to create various bypasses. Sometimes there's a, qu a quadruple, they call it? Yeah. Four? Triple bypass, triple, <coughs> triple. Yeah. Triple is Vi three ways. Various, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes that's what you have to do to get around, create new ones. So this individual somehow, what he's going to need, he's going to need a bypass, and that's good, that it's going to involve adapting various midot. In other words, instead of combating this letzanut, the only way to do it through the back door, by somehow getting him to not to let go of this, you won't, you won't, you won't succeed, but by adapting certain traits, certain itnagyo, certain kinds of behaviors that hopefully, with time, will neutralize the effects of letzanut. And I'll tell you what they are soon. Before we go into what they are, we just have to understand a little bit why. What's the problem? Why? this Litzanut is not allowing us to deal with it directly. Why can't we just deal with it directly like with any other Midah? You know, just about any other Midah, you can deal with them directly. You can teach a person a little bit of humbleness. You can teach a person to calm down. You can teach a person to, uh, to be more uh, generous. I mean, there's various ways on, on, on convincing people. This one, you can't deal with it directly. You have to go through the back door. And this is very interesting. Midat HaLetzanut, the reason why it's so difficult is because it's a Marechet Hagana, as we would call it in Hebrew. It's a defense system. The guy has erected a big defense system that's blocking anything you throw at him. Letzanut, therefore, is a defense mechanism. And I think it's brought down the Sefer Misilat Sharim somewhere in that book, Path of the, of the Just that this defense mechanism acts like a shield that you've just put oil on. When you put oil on, on a shield, all the arrows that you throw at it are, are uh, what's deflected. the word? Deflected, yes, thank you. The arrow, all the arrows are deflected. So you throw an arrow, criticism after criticism, you yell at him. Zenofel, the nishmat, it falls off. That's how he, said, he describes it. He describes it like a shield that is covered with oil, it's so slippery that anything you throw at it is deflected. Therefore, even if occasionally you get a guy to give him a big drasha, 
where most people's hearts are warmed and awakened, by him it, it, it doesn't do anything. And if he once upon a time did have yir'ah, fear of Hashem and Musar, the Lissanut had, would have by then destroyed it already. In other words, what you have that is good is, is cooled off and destroyed because of Lissanut, and what comes at you is deflected because of the system that is acting as a defense. Now you can begin to understand a little bit about the story of Hanukkah and about Amalek. What does the Greeks and Amalek have in common? What do the Greeks, Yavan, and Amalek have in common? They're very different, right? These guys speak Greeks. These guys are Romans. Very different kinds of nations. Even though they both were our enemies, they both attacked us in a from a different angle. What did the Greeks attempt to do? And that's the story of Hanukkah. Now it's Hanukkah. The Greeks said, let's not fight them head on. Head on? <sighs> Who needs to do that? We have such a beautiful uh, culture. culture. Beautiful. The language is beautiful. The philosophy is great. Everything is beautiful. Look at our art and everything, our palaces. Let's impress them. Okay. The problem is the Jew is a stubborn guy. Plus, the Jew has something called Torah. Torah makes him even more stubborn. It makes him resist anything. We got to weaken his attachment to the Torah. How do you weaken his attachment to the Torah? By first looking down at it, ah, oh, this is nothing. This is primitive stuff. This is outdated. This is uh, stories from Bob and Zaidi, right? This is not, this is not uh, real stuff. You got to look at this. This is philosophy. This is modern stuff. You know, this is uh, outdated, primitive. When that didn't work, of course, they had to decree all kinds of decrees that they should not learn the Torah. They should not keep Shabbat. Shabbat, what a waste. Work seven days a week. Why, why, take, a, <laughs> why take a break? So they tried to make fun of the Jews. They tried to deride them. They tried to show them how beautiful their stuff is. Now let's look at Amalek. Amalek, what did they do? Amalek is arrogant. Esav is arrogant. The Nazis were arrogant. The Aryan race, the Aryan race is better and superior than everybody else. And in order to, to convince everybody of that, what did they do? They, they made, made fun. Into nothing. What is that? They made everybody else into nothing. Into nothing. That's the only way. Everybody else is nothing. You kill all the gypsies. You kill the Jews. They're nothing. They're not even human. They're worse than animals. And this is what they, of course, try to imbue into the children, and to convince all the Germans of that fact, through cartoons, making fun of Jews who are bloodsuckers. I'm sure many of you have seen the protocols of Zion, you've heard that Jews are trying to dominate and take over the world. All propaganda. When you can't win a war intellectually, this is what they do. Nobody has ever tried to make a war with a Jew intellectually, because you know what? They would lose. You're going to go against the Jew with the, with the Sechel? You would lose. And some priests here and there tried to argue with Jews, Jewish rabbi. Guess what? They lost. And they got upset. <laughs> they got upset. Right? But you can't. You can't win a logical war with the Jew. So they had to do this. Derision, expelling, take away their equal rights. We are better than you. What do you have? Tell me, what do you have that's better in your religion? Show the other cheek? I think that's worse. <laughs> Give him the other cheek. What do you have better in Christianity? What's better in Islam? What, what is it? They have nothing. How are you going to win? Oh, you need his blood. I mean, what do you mean? This? That's it? You need his blood? <laughs> I mean, think about it. What do they have that we don't have? <laughs> they can't. How you, so they can't do it. They can't convince you. What is their Gan Eden, a bigger Gan Eden? Or their purgatory is, uh, is something else. I mean, so therefore they couldn't win a war with the Sechel, so they had to make fun. This is nothing. This is Baba Mai says, this is the real stuff. This is the real Aryan race, the blue eyes and the blonde hair and whatever. And that's, that's, you know. Now, who, do you, who was the victims of all of this throughout history? Well, once upon a time we had a victims called Mityavnim. You heard about them? They were Hellenists. 
they were taken by it. The Greek language, yes, let's be more like them. Let's not stand out. Let's wear Greek clothes. Let's go to the gyms. Let's be like them. And that's what the Greeks wanted. Let them assimilate and we won't have to fight them. They'll be like us. Who was recently the Hellenists? More recently, in the last 200 years, the reform movement. Let's cut away a little bit. It's, it's too Jewish. It stands out too much. Let, let us not stand out. Be too different than the Germans and the Europeans. After all, that's what's bringing anti-Semitism. You see? So they're falling prey to this kind of of letzanut of goyim. Letzanut of goyim. That's what it is. Plus pressure. Letzanut plus pressure. And why did this happen to them? Why did this, all this pressure work on them? Because there was no Jewish pride. And why was there no Jewish pride? Because there's no Torah. Rabbis always warn us that the greatest enemy of the Jew is ignorance. If you don't learn about who you are, about what your mission is, you don't learn Torah, then you are an empty vessel that's going to be filled with something else. You're going to be an, you're going to fall prey. You're going to be a victim of all these all these influences out there. There's a lot of enemies, right? So be careful. Know who you are. Learn about your, uh, yourself. Learn Torah, because the more you know about yourself, the better you will be equipped to fight off these forces that are trying to annihilate you. If not physically, then spiritually. And that's the, basically the difference between the Greeks and the Romans, or the Greeks and the Amalek, is Amalek went after, after us physically as well. Besides trying to detach us from Torah, cooling us off. Besides that, he was a bitter enemy physically too. Whereas the Greeks, even though they, they, they killed many Jews too, they were trying to more cool us off from our, uh, and remove us from, from the Torah, detaching us from that which was spiritual from the service of the Beit HaMidash. But either one, the two of them were dangerous. Rabbi, yeah. Can we uh, characterize Korach as a, as a late rabbi when he asked the halakhic yes. questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. You have a lot of individuals who, besides other problems like jealousy or gava, they're letzim too. Yeah. They're clowns. They're mockers. Yeah. And remember, because a gaftan, an arrogant person, has that a little bit or has that ability to make fun of others. Sure. There are, yeah. are there some astrological signs that are more inclined to be late some rabbi uh, as opposed to other signs? Well, astrologically speaking, there's different, there's different kinds of late sim. There's one who, inside, without verbalizing it, will look down at others. And he will look down at others because he thinks highly of himself. There's one who will look down at others, not because he thinks highly of himself, but because he... He really thinks that that guy is a nebuch, you know, and he enjoys stepping on others, and that's worse. That's that's when we said before. Let's say Zed Yahir. We said he has something evil in him. That's the real let's. That's the worst kind of let's. Whereas one is more associated with an arrogance of self-importance. Yeah. So there's various degrees, and depending on the mazal, obviously they may have a little bit to do with it. Yeah. Sure. So anyway. Now we can understand a little bit also the problem with Mesit and Medea. Mesit and Medea, the Torah speaks about, are, are Jews who may have gone to the other camp. And now it's not enough that they went to the other camp and embraced another faith or religion. They're trying to be missionaries to remove Jews from their faith. Why don't they mind their own business? Why do they come and try to get Jews? You, you wanted to convert them? Go ahead. We won't bother you. By Why are you coming after more? On a, on a subconscious level, they're bothered. Their conscience is bothering them. In order for them to know that the, what they did is right, they have to get more people. They have to cool others off. And that is what the rabbis compare Amalek's action to a hot bath. What happens when you go into a very hot bath? You cooled it off for somebody else. Amalek, when they fought against us, even though they knew that we were victorious, Hashem was with us, Mitzrayim lost, the, Egypt, the Egyptians lost, they got Makot. They said, no, it was maybe just a coincidence. You know, we can fight them. We'll, 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 we'll defeat them. And because they were able to, to fight against us, even though they didn't win completely, they cooled off the bathtub, the hot bathtub, meaning the, the, the chances that others will come and fight us. They, cooled, they, they allowed others to think, yeah, the Jews are defeatable. The Amalek was able to do wage war on them. So 
the problems are with the Mesit and Mediach is that Chaz Shalom, if they cool off and if they've joined another camp, people who see them, people who, who associate with them have a chance to say, yeah, maybe we should try it. Maybe it's not bad after all. They still are nice people. They still are okay. They didn't become animals. You know, so that's the danger. It's not only in, them, in themselves, what they have done to themselves, but they tend to also cool other people off. And as I said, they do so because subconsciously maybe they're bothered. If nobody else does it and only them, well, maybe there's something wrong with what they did. But if they get others to do like them, then they feel better, especially if they succeed. So that's where there's a great danger out there of people trying to missionary, being a missionary to get others to join. We have to be very careful with them. That is the, the Midah of Amalek, to cool other people off. So this particular let's, the rabbis tell us, the only way a person really becomes a let's, 100%, is if first he removed any Ol Shamaim or Malchut Shamaim from himself. He has had to be Porek Ol Malchut Shamaim, the yoke of heaven. Otherwise, he wouldn't do what he's doing. In other words, an individual who's actively making fun of others, actively cooling other people off from doing mitzvot, making fun of them, has no Ol Malchut Shamaim. In other words, he would not, otherwise he, he would not do what he's doing. That is why there's an interesting uh, chazal. The rabbis tell us that Hashem tells Esav, Esav, you know why you lost out? You lost out, Esav. You got, you're gone from this world. You missed your chance. You know what it was in you? The letzanut that you had. The mockery. The fact that you were a rasha, that you did all kinds of sins. A lot of people have done sins. Well, you could do teshuvah. Hashem can send him back in a Gilgul to repair it. But you know what really did you? You know what really caused you to lose this, this world? Was your Letzanut. person who is a Letzan, as I said earlier, his chances are slim of doing Teshuvah. That is why perhaps the rabbis tell us in the, in the worship of the golden calf, it says, Vayakumu Letzachek, the Erev Rav got up to laugh. And the rabbis tell us when the Erev Rav got up to laugh, when they created this golden calf, Letzachek means Avodah Zarah. It also means Gilui Arayot. It also, not only does it mean idol worshipping, it also means adultery. It means all these sins, these cardinal sins. But what does it have to do with Avodah Zarah? Why idol worshipping? What is idol worship? Idol worship really is <coughs> an, a, a cheap alternative. <coughs> it's a cheap alternative to religion. You're setting up your own, system, your own system of values that you have created according to your whims and wishes. That's what Avodah Zarah is. You are creating a system of values based on your whims and wishes. There's no God, there's no responsibility. Basically, this is what you believe in. That's what evolution is, right? Evolution is everybody came from a monkey. There's no... Yeah, I, I saw a very, very yeah. different uh, yes. theory yeah. that monkeys came from men. That's I know true. it sounds reversed. No, no, sure. But uh, the, Hashem yeah. wanted to punish the generation. That's true. So he made monkeys from men, not That's men true. Of course. There is a Madrash that says in, in Dora Palaga, in the, in the generation that built the Tower of Babel, uh, a number of those individuals who were involved became monkeys. Right. Yeah. And, you know, some of them were punished and they became monkeys. Not the other way around, exactly. But anyway, all this Avodah Zarah, this evolution is a form of Letzachek. It's a cheap alternative to make fun, not to be serious about life. Because what is Letzachek? To, to laugh. It's not to take something seriously. Not to assume responsibilities. So you fabricate, you make up your own system of values <coughs> that you decide what is right and what is wrong. Instead of admitting to the truth. Okay. Now that we understand now that we understand how serious this midah is and how difficult it is to, to work on, what, what, is, what can we do? So I, saw, I started off saying that it, it requires a tremendous amount of work through the back door. Back door meaning that you have to create a bypass by introducing various midot, various other positive midot that hopefully will neutralize this let's note, this marker. What are those midot? Well, besides midot, number one, that is always the most important one, if any, any way you can get this, to that child, to that individual, that will do him a lot of help. And that is the Torah. Obviously, if, you, if there's any way that that person can be exposed to Torah, any way possible, with a tape, with a shiur, 
that will do wonders. Why? Because the Midrash says like this. The Midrash says, once the Torah enters a human being, an individual, Litzanut comes out. Torah enters, Litzanut, mockery comes out. Because Torah is serious. The other way around, Chaz Shalom, Litzanut enters, the Torah comes out. It has the effect of one expels the other. You bring in Torah, if somehow you succeeded to bring him some Torah, that Torah will expel Litzanut. You bring a person Litzanut, that will expel any Torah that he had in him. The two are not compatible. So if somehow he can be exposed to the Torah, you've done him a big help. That is a tremendous amount of light that can drive away a lot of darkness and confusion. <coughs> as far as Midot, one Midah is Midat Ashtika. And that is what you will find in Orchot Sadikim. You will find that, where does he speak about Letzanut? In Shatika. You look, there's, not, there's nothing about Letzanut. You read through all the chapters, no Letzanut. If you go to Shatika to silence, you will find he has a, a couple pages about Letzanut over there. Because Letzanut involves talk. And talk can be Lashonara, there can be all kinds of forbidden kind of talk. And that is how he gets into Letzanut. A good control of a person's speech, of what comes out of his mouth, that kind of an exercise, control what you say, how you say it, can help a person, again, through the back door, to patch up, to neutralize the Letzanut, indirectly. The second Midah is a Midah that we'll be speaking about next week, and that is Midah Zerizut, one of the most important Midot that is one of the very first midot that a person needs to work on, on himself to really grow is, as it is found in Sefer Mesirat Sharim, is Zerizut, which the rabbis speak about. That is one of the, of the rungs, is that called, of the ladder? Uh-huh. If you want to really grow, growth, it re- requires Zerizut. Zerizut means <coughs> diligence. So Bezat Hashem, that will be the midah that we'll be speaking about next week. Zerizut is a very, very powerful midah. And Bezat Hashem, next week, when you come, Bezat Hashem, you will see how this may help him indirectly. So we're going through the back door. We're, we're, we're asking him somehow to adapt these midot, amongst others, and hopefully they will neutralize the Letzanot. Letzanot, very difficult to reach directly, head on, go through the back door and introduce exercises that he doesn't know, he doesn't realize they have anything to do with emet, they have anything to do. It's for your own benefit. You know, somehow, you know, get him, especially if it's your child, get him to become like that, and that will help hopefully neutralize the Letzanut. There is one more thing that I don't want to advise all of you to do, but sometimes it's, it's possible to do. And you'll be surprised at what that is. How do you deal powerfully with the Letz? You make fun of him. <laughs> He's making fun of others, He's deriding of others. You do that to him. Now, the reason why I don't want to advise you to do it, even though it's brought down, is because you really have to know what you're doing. You have to be very, very capable of dealing with an individual on all levels, outsmarting him, showing him, pointing at, not bluffing. If you can somehow make fun of all that he does, but in a very smart way, that can also be powerful medicine. <laughs> That's what he's trying to do. Do it to him. And how do I know that this works? Because that's what Hashem does to others too. There's a special pasuk that says, Im la letzim hu yalitz. To the letzim hu yalitz. A Kadosh Baruch Hu makes fun of them. He brings them down. He shows them that they're nothing. You made fun of others. I'll show you who you are. So this is, it's brought down in the books, in the Sefarim, that this can be a way sometimes to really put a person down. <coughs> what I'd like to end with is with, uh, with an unfortunate fact, we are the generation of Mashiach. Excuse me? We're, and what's unfortunate about that? It's very fortunate. See, you have to wait till the end of, the, of, of my sentence. What's unfortunate about that? In the generation of Mashiach, there's all kinds of issues that we have to deal with. Yeshayahu describes the leadership of, <coughs> of Yomot Mashiach. The leadership, the leadership of the people sitting in Sion, in Yerushalayim, will be Leitzim and Shelatzon. Clowns, mockers, sitting in the Knesset. And Shechelm, people that come from Helm, if you know what that means. They don't know how to run a country. People that think they're smart. People that think that they know what to do. And the Navi calls them and Shelatzon, mockers. 
clowns, people who are not serious, people who are making fun, people who are just playing around. And Hashem says, all that you're thinking of doing, your peace treaties, He says that, peace treaty, it will not succeed, it will fail. Okay? Your enemies will go after you. These are very, very, these are very powerful words of a Navi being written many, many years ago about the leadership in Yemot HaMashiach, Dafka, even though he was referring to leadership back then too, but it's especially now, especially now when we see those words coming true, that these people are trying to do all kinds of things, but it's without Yirat Shamaim, it's without the, the proper Ashkafa, without the proper outlook of the Torah, without seeking the advice of Chachamim, because they think they're Chachamim. So you have arrogance, you have Ritzanut, you have all the, the Midot, the terrible Midot that are that the leadership has that's driving that, that country. Baruch Hashem, that is not exactly driving the country because HaKadosh Baruch is the one that's driving the country. But at least, internally, they're trying to do it in their way and of course their way is not going to succeed. We see the results in the education system. The secular education system has failed. There's crime in the schools. And they can see themselves, if they are willing to admit it, that the, the, the Torah schools the observant schools have succeeded. Relatively speaking, they're much, much better. And, and, and they don't have the problems that the secular schools have. So that's, that is unfortunately the situation that we're dealing with. And all of this is, of course, a letzanut that they have imported from the goyim. They import everything from the goyim, not just gadgets, not just technology but also, unfortunately, the bad influences. They learn from the ways of the goyim. That's what I, we spoke about before. The part of the reason why the Hashem tells us, warns us in the Torah, don't follow the ways of the goyim because you're going to learn from their midot. You're also going to learn from their nature. You're going to learn from their character to, to be like them, to do what they do. You know, have, have anybody ever seen a, a bullfight? You're not supposed to go to a bullfight. Why not? What's the difference between a Spanish and a Portuguese bullfight, do you know? They kill the bull from the Spanish. In, the Spanish kill the bull. The Portuguese, they have the fun, but they don't kill the bull, at least. What? So what's wrong with going to see it? Well, that introduces cruelty. Besides a waste of time, besides associating with these people, I mean, you become like them. The Torah warns us to be careful not to follow their ways, not to be like them, not to learn from their midot. Yeah? Well, you didn't say... Besides our lates, there's three other uh, midot that don't see the Shekhinah. Yeah, I didn't, speak, I didn't speak about it because we'll talk about them separately. Okay. One of them is liars. liars. One of them is Chanfanim. Uh, is people who, uh, who um, flatter. Right? There's various groups that don't see. But they, 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 these are separate midot. They have to come for the next 36 yeah, <laughs> yeah. These are all separate midot that we'll talk about. But anyway... So this is the situation that we have today that people, not only people, the Jewish people, unfortunately, because it's such a small world and because there's so much exposure through the internet, through the TV and the newspapers, people can easily learn from the ways of the Goyim. And the Torah warns us to be very, very careful not to learn from the ways of the Goyim. So what's the best way not to learn from them? The Hanukkiah. What, what's the real mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah? The real mitzvah is lighting it for Sumenisa where people can see it. Publicize. Publicize your Jewishness. Publicize who you are. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed of yourself. Publicize everything. Go out and open. Wear your kippah. Show your Yurat Shamaim. Show that this is who you are. That's the only way a Jew will maintain the strength of his character, the strength of what he believes in, of his emunah, of his yirat shamayim. That I mean, you still have to be careful. You still have to be careful because influence is influence. You know, people are weak. People can easily fall. You still have to be careful. You have to be attached to the Torah. The Torah will guard us, will protect us, will teach us, will guide us. You can't do without the Torah. The lighting of the Hanukkiah represents the light of the Torah, and that light of the Torah has to go out, has to be shown, has to be demonstrated, not only for ourselves to see, but for other Jews who do not know about it, for them to see. And for the Goyim to see, oh, these Jews are proud of themselves. They're not going to want to be like us. They're strong. This is our protector. Therefore, perhaps, perhaps, through this mitzvah of, of, of spreading the light of the Hanukkah, 
spreading the light of the Torah, Bezat Hashem, we will be able to protect ourselves from all the bad influences, and Bezat Hashem, continue to remain strong and connected to the Torah. Thank you. According to uh, most Polskim, uh, we're in the Yarmouk is not the It's no longer, maybe yes, maybe no.